Good afternoon. This is Eric Goffelerud, and I am pleased to present this webinar, which is in a series of webinars that are being held by the Hospital Espert Initiative. And this one is, I think, of particular interest and importance, which is an update on the Joint Commission's tobacco and substance use core measure sets. In this presentation, we will uh, hear from Celeste Milton, Associate Project Director at the Joint Commission, and also from leaders in two hospitals that have been working to implement performance measurement in their hospitals. We will, we will be taking questions uh, throughout the presentation, but uh, we, we, we expect, we're, we're getting a lot of feed, background feedback. Um, okay, we, we would expect that, that uh, we will hold most of the questions and answer them. At the, at the conclusion of uh, the presentation. If you have any, any technical issues, you're having difficulty with the sound or difficulty uh, uh, understanding terms, please do comment in the, in the bar to the right and uh, uh, send text messages or messages to uh, Misty Story, who is managing that for us. Uh, we very much want to have this as a, 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 uh, a discussion of how to take these very useful and important measure sets and get them into the practice of hospitals. So this is a, uh, a, a, pros a process-oriented uh, discussion and set of presentations. With that, I'd like to turn it, uh, the, the conversation presentation over to Celeste, who will uh, um, uh, help us understand where the Joint Commission is coming from, the measure sets, and how they're uh, taking those measures forward. Celeste? Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Celeste Melton. I'm an Associate Project Director in the Division of Healthcare Quality Evaluation at the Joint Commission. I am the clinical lead for the tobacco treatment and substance use core measure sets. And today I'm going to be going over a little bit about the background of how these measures came about and discuss a little bit about some of the changes in measure specifications. So I'm sure that you probably have questions, as you can see from this slide, and that's what I'm here today is to help to answer some of these questions and provide some clarification. So now let's talk just a little bit about some of the statistics that are out there. And I'm sure that most of you that have signed on are aware of these, but just as a review, why these measures are important. If we take a look at the annual causes of death in the United States, um, some of these actually are uh, directly related to behaviors. Um, if you look at the top line there, smoking by far is one of the leading causes of death. And if we go down a couple of bars, um, alcohol um, tends to be one of the more problematic issues that we have. When you compare that to other um, problems that um, cause deaths in the United States, you can see that uh, these uh, both have a rather large impact on society. So as we talk a little bit more about causes of death, um, looking at heart disease and cancer, making up maybe one half of the deaths. But then we take a look at behaviors related and in majority of cases, 40% of the time, this is due to things that uh, people tend to do or not do, such as not um, following a proper diet, being inactive, um, using tobacco products, or drinking or having drug use. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, how these measures might be important to identify some of these behaviors in some of your patients today. Talking just about the toll of tobacco in the United States, it's one of those things where it's the single most preventable cause of death today in the United States, and it can be directly attributed to one in five deaths and over 400,000 deaths a year as a result of using tobacco products. When we talk about the loss to society as far as productivity, you're looking at close to $82 billion annually, and even more staggering is the cost of uh, health care related to smoking-related uh, problems at $96 billion. 
Looking at the economic cost of alcohol abuse, $185 billion in cost to society just for misuse, and another $143 billion is estimated related to drug problems. $19 billion in health care costs for alcohol problems, and $14 billion for drug problems. Some pretty staggering numbers, and as you look at the other numbers as far as potential life loss as a result of act, uh, injuries due to alcohol, you're looking at um, over 2 million years of potential life lost. Pretty staggering statistics. So now as we talk about how this project came about, this was a funded project in partnership with um, the Center for Substance Abuse and Treatment and, uh, excuse me, and SAMHSA. And the, the project lasted a year and a half. Uh, as we do with all of our core measures, we first appoint a technical advisory panel um, consisting of experts in the field. The panel um, came together and identified some areas of measurement. We put these measures out for public comment period. And following that, then we worked with hospitals to recruit them into a pilot test, first to do alpha testing where they would go over the measures to determine the validity, to make sure that we were measuring what we set out to measure. And then finally, a pilot test, which consisted of 24 hospitals in 19 states across the country over a six-month period. During that time, over 9,000 medical records were reviewed. The Joint Commission staff conducted reliability site visits at 10 hospitals that were randomly selected, reviewing randomly selected medical records. And this helps us determine how well we've written measure specifications and what we would need to do to clarify definitions and descriptions so that everyone reading the specifications would get the same answers. The final measure specifications were incorporated into a specifications manual for the National Hospital Inpatient Quality Measures version 4.0 and were posted on the Joint Commission website July 1st of 2011 and became effective with January 1st, 2012 discharges. So the specifications have been available for almost a year now for hospitals to select. Waiting on my slide to move here. Here we go. All right, so we're going to talk first about the tobacco core measures. And this slide here displays the four distinct measures that are being um, part of this measure set. And these measures are based on treating tobacco use and dependence clinical pra practice guidelines from 2008, um, the update, and it's based on solid evidence. So we're going to go over each one of the measures individually and talk a little bit about the details. Okay, tobacco one is our tobacco use screening measure. The domain that we're looking at here is assessment and screening. This is a process measure and a higher rate is noted for improvement. So why is this important? Well, you've already seen in the previous slides that talk about the cost to society and we know that with tobacco use, we're looking at over 400,000 deaths in the United States um, just related to tobacco use. It's also a known cause for a number of cancers, heart condition, um, stroke, and contributing to stroke, pregnancy complications, and lung disease. Smoking attributable health care expenses have exceeded over $96 billion annually also in the United States. So now when we look at our measures, um, all of our measures are constructed in, in a, the same uniform fashion. You have a numerator and a denominator population. So let's look at the bottom line. That is our denominator. That's our larger populations that we would be measuring of those patients that come in. We would be looking at those that are 18 years or older. So these would be all those patients that would be eligible for this measure first to be looked at. Of those then, we would be looking in the numerator, which we're trying to get the number to match the denominator if possible. We're looking for 100% here. This would be the numbers of patients who are screened for tobacco use status um, of this group. So now let's talk a little bit about denominator populations. As with all of our core measures, we have both included and excluded populations. In the included populations, there may be additional qualifiers that are not already outlined in the denominator statement. For this particular measure, there's no additional inclusions. However, we do have some excluded populations. Patients that are under 18 years of age would not be screened um, for the purposes of this measure. Patients with cognitive impairment would also not um, be um, screened for this. And what we mean by impairment would be that the patient's either comatose, they're uptunded, 
confused, have memory loss, or they're mentally retarded. Um, we would not include or consider patients to have impairment who have overdosed or intoxicated because at some point um, when they would be alert, they would be eligible then to be screened. Also, patients with a length of stay less than a day or greater than 120 days would be excluded from this measure. In addition to having the populations that I've identified, we also work with data elements. So the denominator data elements, these would be the questions that would be asked in order to determine if the patients are eligible for the denominator. We'd first look at the admission date and birth date. That would give us our age so that we knew if those patients would be eligible. And as I mentioned, the cognitive impairment, as I have already explained, would be something that we would look for to exclude them. And then finally, the discharge date would help us um, determine if they've been there greater than a day or less than 120 days. Now let's look at our numerator. Just as with our denominator, we have um, populations. So in the included populations, patients that are refusing screenings would be included, and um, there would be no additional exclusions to this uh, particular measure, numerator rather. So now in our numerator, we have one data element, and this would be the question that you would ask to make determination um, of their tobacco use status. As you take a look closer at this data element, we have uh, a combination of number of allowable values. Actually, we have a total of 14 that looks at different combinations of tobacco use, which would include uh, use of smokeless tobacco, cigarettes, pipes, and cigars, whether the patient had no use. We'd be looking at the uh, period of the past 30 days prior to admission as considered the, their use status. Um, some exclusions would be the use of e-cigarettes, hookah pipes, or illegal drugs such as marijuana. If there's conflicting data present, you would select the type of tobacco product in the volume mentioned and assume heaviest use when the volume is not documented. So that's our first measure. Now we're going to move into our second measure. And this would be tobacco use treatment provided or offered. The domain that we'd be assessing here is patient care. This is also a process measure. And once again, a higher rate would be noted for improvement. Why is this important? Um, we do know that timely interventions can reduce the risk of patients from suffering from tobacco-related disease. So you have an opportunity when the patient's in the hospital because they can't smoke for one thing, and you have a captive audience. So this is a time to take a look to see if uh, possibly an intervention can be done. And the evidence also backs the fact that these uh, in in interventions can be very effective and can be very um, good as far as controlling costs. So now again, looking at our populations measured in our denominator, once again, we're looking at that same group of patients, those hospitalized inpatients that have reached 18 years or older. However, they would have to be identified as current tobacco users. Then you would further look at those patients who either received or refused counseling, practical counseling to quit, and received or refused FDA-approved cessation medication. So it's a combination of both here that they would have either been um, received or re refused either of. Looking now on our denominator populations, we would be taking a look again. Um, there's no additional inclusions, but we have some similar exclusions to the first measure. Once again, the patients have to have reached 18 years of age, do not have cognitive impairment. Um, patients that are not to current tobacco users wouldn't be eligible. Patients refusing or not screened um, would be excluded. And then the length of stay, once again, less than one day or greater than 120 days. Now let's go into our denominator. This looks very similar to our first measure. Um, we're getting that age again. And um, once again, we're looking at the tobacco use status to determine if they're eligible for the measure. Within our numerator, um, we would be including patients that did refuse the counseling and or the FDA-approved cessation medications. And um, we'd be excluding for populations, this is only for medication, um, would be our smokeless tobacco users, our pregnant smokers, the light smokers, or patients with reasons for not administering the medication. We'll be talking about that in a little more depth here. So now within our numerator, we work with GAD elements um, again. Um, these ICD-9 codes help us identify um, some of these patients, um, for example, the pregnant patients. Um, the reason for no tobacco cessation medication during the hospital stay 
could include allergies, a drug interaction for all of the FDA-approved medications, along with other medications that the patient might be required to take, um, other, doc other reasons documented by the physician, the pharmacist, the advanced practice nurse, the physician's assistant, must be explicitly documented in order for this uh, to be answered that there is a reason in the medical record. Um, medications are listed in Appendix C of the Specifications Manual on Table 9.1, so you can review that to take a look at the medications that would be considered part of the cessation medications. Um, tobacco use status, again, is evaluated, and then tobacco use treatment, and then practical uh, counseling is also evaluated. The counseling consists of recognizing the danger signals which might trigger the patient to go back to using tobacco, how to develop coping skills, and then just basic information on quitting. So we also have an alternate measure here, um, tobacco use treatment uh, 2A. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that one. In this one now, we're looking um, at the same denominator population, but instead in our numerator, we're looking at only the ones that actually received the counseling and the medications while they were hospitalized. So you'll note that the patients that refused are no longer part of the numerator because what we're trying to establish here is what is the actual rate of patients that receive this uh, treatment while they're in the hospital. This gives us a clearer picture. So looking at the numerator populations here, you would not include the patients that are refusing counseling and or medication. And the excluded populations are going to be the same as they are for the other measures. This just gives us an alternate rate just to kind of see how often this is actually occurring. So we will move now into our third measure, tobacco use treatment provided or offered at discharge. The domain here is continuity of care. This is again a process measure and a higher rate is noted for improvement. Once again, this is an important um, issue because we know that tobacco dependence is a chronic disease. We also know that treatment is most effective when interventions during the hospitalization continue after they've left your facility. So this is an opportunity to keep those treatments going. Looking at the populations that we're measuring, again, um, you'll notice the denominator remains the same. We're looking at those patients that we identified in Measure 2 that are current tobacco users that are 18 years of age or older. Now we're looking to go into the numerator, the number of patients who referred to or refused this evidence-based outpatient counseling to be continued and either received or refused a prescription for the FDA-approved FDA cessation medication at discharge. Looking now in our denominator, there are no additional inclusions, but we do have the same exclusions pretty much that you've probably seen in the, the previous measures. Um, they have to, if they're under 18, they're not considered. They have the cognitive impairment, if they're not a current tobacco user, patients that have refused or not screened, and then if they have that length of stay less than a day or greater than 120 days. And in addition, if any patient were to have expired, um, you know, and that resulted in the discharge, they would also be excluded. We have some more exclusions, patients that have left AMA, if they've been discharged to another hospital or another healthcare facility. Um, if they've gone um, into hospice care after they've left, or if they do not reside in the United States, um, they would also be removed from the measure population. Here are our data elements again for the denominator. Once again, we're going to calculate that age, um, remove patients with cognitive impairment. Um, the discharge disposition here would be identifying those patients that might have expired, and then again, the tobacco use status again to identify those patients that are current users. In our numerator, then, you know, the included patients would be those patients that are, um, have refused that prescription or they have refused that referral for the outpatient counseling. The excluded populations, again, are going to be the smokeless tobacco users, uh, the pregnant smokers, the light smokers, and then the patients that, once again, have that reason for not uh, being prescribed the cessation medication. Looking again here at the numerator data elements, um, we, again, have those codes to identify those pregnant patients. We would be looking for that prescription for the tobacco cessation medication. Um, the reason for no tobacco cessation medication, if that would be the case, referral to the outpatient counseling, and then again their tobacco use status. Um, Over-the-counter medication will qualify um, if it is on Table 9.1 in Appendix C, and referral to a quit line is defined as telephone counseling. So those are just um, some little notes that you need to know about when looking closer at those. 
Okay, we also have an alternate rate that we display for tobacco um, 3, it's 3A. And then again, this looks very similar to 3, except in this case, in our numerator, we're only including those that actually um, took that referral and those that received that prescription. So that's the main difference here once again. Um, we're looking to try and get that true, true rate of those people that actually got those interventions. So as a result in the numerator, you would not include any patients refusing the referral or refusing the prescription. And the excluded populations are the same as they are for tobacco 3. Okay, we're into our last measure in this measure set, tobacco 4, and this is taking a look at tobacco use um, assessing status after discharge. Again, the domain is continuity of care. Um, this is now a process measure. Originally, this was specified as an outcome measure, but we've made some enhancements to it that we'll be discussing here. And again, a higher rate is noted for improvement. Um, this is an important measure because relapse is common after the first two weeks um, after discharge from the hospital. So that follow-up piece um, is integral in trying to keep these patients um, um, free of tobacco. So now let's take a look at our numerator and denominator. They mentioned we've made some enhancements. These enhancements are going to take place with January 1st, 2013 discharges. They're in the next version of the manual. Um, so I wanted you to be aware of those today. In the, numer in the denominator, we're again looking at those hospitalized patients that were 18 years of age or older that were identified as current tobacco users. And then in the numerator, we'd be looking at the number of discharge patients who were contacted between 15 and 30 days. That's the change, 15 and 30 days after hospital discharge and follow-up information regarding tobacco use status is collected. That part is a little different too, and we'll see here in just a minute. In our denominator populations, um, there are no additional inclusions that we haven't already discussed. We do have a couple of new exclusions. Once again, the patients that are under 18 years of age, those with cognitive impairment or not current users are excluded. Patients that were not screened, um, we have the length of stay less than a day or greater than 120. Those patients who expired or left AMA, the new exclusions here have to do with cognitive impairment and the fact that screening wasn't done. So that's a little bit different than the current specifications. We have additional exclusions here. Um, if patients, um, a new one on um, this particular side is the last one if they've been readmitted during that follow-up time frame. But we again are excluding those patients that went to another hospital or healthcare facility or had hospice care. Um, we're not continuing to reside in the U.S. after discharge, had no phone number or contact information available, or patients that were discharged to any kind of a detention facility, jail, or prison. They would not be part of this population. In our denominator dead elements, we have the similar ones that you've seen in the previous um, measures where we're get calculating age, removing cognitive impaired patients, any patients that might have expired, and then again, those that are not current tobacco users. Numerator populations, there are no additional inclusions or exclusions that have not already been discussed in the numerator statement. So now let's take a look at those numerator data elements. As I alluded, now we have kind of parsed those out, so we're getting a little more richer information during that follow-up period. So let's first talk about the follow-up contact. A total of six attempts to contact this patient between 15 and 30 days should be documented in order to answer yes to follow-up contact. Um, you will also be documenting the date. If a clinic visit occurred within the time frame, this could be used to answer yes to that. Um, if mail or email is returned as not valid or the patient was readmitted within the time frame, the case would also be excluded. An attempt should now be recorded in the medical record before you were keeping logs, and now we're asking that be part of the medical record. And the contact date now has changed from the earliest date to the latest date that the patient was contacted. But as you can see, we're getting more richer information. First, we're asking during that contact um, is, are they continuing with counseling? Are they continuing with their medication? And are they still tobacco-free? So we're getting a little richer data by making this follow-up call. So now we're going to move into the next set of measures. This could probably be the cousin to the tobacco treatment measures, the, the substance use measures. Um, so these, again, are behavioral related. and we're going to take a look at each one of these four here. They're going to be very similar in construct, but there are different pieces to these measures. These measures are based on a Veteran Administration and Department of Defense Clinical Practice Guideline for the Management of Substance Use Disorder. And once again, these are based on solid evidence. 
So let's take a look at our first measure. This would be our alcohol use screening measure. The domain again here is assessment and screening, very similar to screening for tobacco use. Now we're looking at the alcohol use. Also a process measure and a higher rate is noted for improvement. Why is this important? When we take a look at the cost again to society for alcohol misuse, we know they're great and that many times patients that have substance use problems can um, end up with serious injuries. Think about like motor vehicle accidents, patients falling downstairs, and we know that once again that we're looking at over 18 billion in uh, attributable health care expenses as a result of um, these problems. So now let's take a look at the numerator and denominator populations for these patients. Again, we're also basically targeting the same denominator, those hospitalized inpatients that have reached 18 years of age or older. Of those patients then, we would take a look at those patients who were screened for alcohol use using a validated screening questionnaire for unhealthy drinking. Within our denominator, there are no additional inclusions. We do have some exclusions. Patients that are less than 18 years of age, once again, if they had cognitive impairment and been there less than a day or greater than 120 days, they would not be a part of this population. Within our denominator data element, we begin calculating that age with admission date and birth date, and also length of stay with discharge date, and then um, taking a look at cognitive impairment as a reason to exclude them. Within our numerator populations, the included patients would be patients that um, had an alcohol, blood alcohol test indicating acute intoxication. So if they came in as a result of a motor vehicle crash, Typically, most states require a, a blood alcohol test to be drawn, so that might be an indication right there. Without even doing a screening, you know you have a positive result. And also, patients refusing screening would be included. And there are no additional exclusions that have not already been articulated. Let's talk about our numerator data element here, our alcohol use status. Screening with a validated tool, um, some examples of that would be the audit, the audit C, the assist, the tweak, the craft, the mast and the G-MAST. The cage is not recommended for severely, because it's typically used for severely alcohol-dependent patients. Right now, you're just trying to do a screening here to make a determination if you need to look a little bit further. Um, screens for no or low risk or moderate risk benefiting from a brief intervention. So um, if the blood alcohol level indicates acute intoxication, you're going to select a moderate risk um, as far as the screen. So that would be how you would go with that. So now let's talk about our next measure. This would be um, sub-2, and this is alcohol use brief intervention provided or offered. The domain here is patient care, and this again is a process measure, and a higher rate is noted for improvement. So why is this important? We do know that brief interventions can improve health and reduce costs. It doesn't take a whole lot to do a brief intervention. That's why they're called brief. And that we do know that it's a prime time because, once again, you have a captive audience. If they're in the hospital, um, you really have an opportunity to reach them through, through this brief intervention. And we're going to be hearing a little bit more about that today from some of the hospitals that have been doing this um, towards the end of the presentation. So let's take a look again at the populations that are measured in our denominator. We're looking again at those inpatients that have reached 18 years of age or older who either had a positive screen for unhealthy alcohol use or alcohol use disorder, and that would include alcohol abuse or alcohol dependence. And then of those patients, the number that received or refused the brief intervention. In our denominator, there are no additional inclusions. We do have some exclusions. Again, those patients under 18 years of age with cognitive impairment, patients that refused um, or were not screened, um, and then those with a length of stay less than a day or greater than 120 days. Additional exclusions include those patients that might have left AMA, ended up being discharged to another hospital or another health care facility, um, were discharged to hospice care, or again, those patients not residing in the U.S. In our denominator, we'd be taking a look at the admission date and birth date again to determine age, the alcohol use status, the cognitive impairment piece to exclude them, and then the discharge date um, for length of stay. Within our numerator, we would be including patients that refused or declined a brief intervention. And also, uh, there are no additional exclusions that we haven't already talked about. So let's talk a little bit about brief intervention. This would be done prior to discharge, and it consists of the five A's, which would be to ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. This should be done by a qualified healthcare professional, such as a physician, a nurse, 
a certified addictions counselor, psychologist, a social worker, or a healthcare educator trained in the brief intervention. We have an um, alternate measure also, and this would be for the brief alcohol, uh, alcohol use brief intervention. An alternate rate, again, we would be taking a look at those patients that had that positive screen, but now we're only looking at those who actually received the intervention. Um, the refusals would not be part of the numerator for this measure. So this gives us, again, a true overall understanding of the patients that actually got the intervention. In our numerator populations, there wouldn't be any um, inclusions or exclusions um, that haven't already been addressed um, in the previous slide. Okay, let's move into our third measure. This is alcohol and drug use disorder um, treatment, rather, provided and offered at discharge. Um, I was just trying to find a slide with just the alcohol, but um, we've got all three problems there. But at any rate, this is, this is about alcohol and drug use, so um, looking at that treatment to be continued. And again, the domain would be continuity of care. The process measure and a higher rate is noted for improvement. Once again, treatment, we know it can significantly improve your health care outcomes for patients and reduce costs. And a sobering statistic here is less than 1 in 20 patients, patients with an addiction are referred for treatment. So we have an extreme opportunity for improvement here. Looking at our numerator and denominator populations, again in our denominator of those patients that have reached 18 years of age or older, that have that alcohol or drug use disorder identified, of those patients then we would be taking a look at those who received or refused at discharge a prescription for medication or treatment for alcohol or drug use disorder or received or refused a referral for addictions treatment. So it's an either or situation here. In our denominator, in our included populations, we're going to be taking a look at patients with principal or other diagnosis codes for alcohol or drug use disorder. We again have tables um, in Appendix B of the uh, specifications manual, uh, table 13.1 and 13.2, to identify those patients. And in addition, we also would be taking a look at principal or other procedure codes on table 13.3. Some of these procedures could include um, alcohol or drug rehab or um, patients being admitted for detoxification. Those are considered procedures, so those also might identify those patients. And then also patients with progress notes or discharge notes indicating drug or alcohol use um, disorder would be included. It, um, we do have some exclusions, again, those patients under 18 years of age, patients with unhealthy, excuse me, unhealthy drinking, not meeting criteria as an alcohol use disorder, uh, those cognitively impaired, those patients who had expired, patients discharged to another facility or um, um, hospital at the time of discharge. Also, again, if they had less than a length, uh, length of stay of less than one day or greater than 120, if they left AMA, we're discharged to hospice care, or once again, we're not residing in the U.S. In our denominator data elements, again, we are looking at some similar ones here. Um, we, uh, the identification of the alcohol or drug disorder. Um, we're taking a look at the admission date and um, birth date again to determine age, um, cognitive impairment to exclude them, discharge date for length of stay, discharge disposition to determine if they had expired, and then those codes that I was just talking about for diagnosis and procedure codes. Now, the alcohol or drug um, disorder can be derived from ICD-9 diagnosis codes or explicit documentation by the clinician um, as a disorder or dependence, and the presence of DT's withdrawal syndrome or admission for detoxification would also uh, qualify. In a numerator, looking at those included populations, um, we would be including those patients that refused um, the FDA-approved medication or refused uh, the referral for addictions treatment, and then there are no additional exclusions. So now in our numerator data elements, we have two of them. First would be the prescription for the alcohol or drug disorder. The list of medications are in Appendix C on Table 9.2 for the FDA-approved medications. And the referral for addictions treatment, um, just so you know, a referral to AA support groups um, or self-help interventions do not meet the intent of the measure. So when we're talking about a referral for addictions treatment, this would include group counseling, individual counseling, a personal physician following them up, a psychiatrist, psychologist, or an addictions counselor. So that there is a distinction here that we're looking at more of a healthcare professional to continue with that treatment and not a self-help group. But that, that's not to say that the self-help groups aren't important, that they do not meet the intent of the measure. 
We also have an alternate measure, as you've noted in the past ones. We're looking again at those patients, um, as you'll note here, that actually receive that prescription um, or that referral. So um, it, the refusals would not be part of the numerator in this case. So once again, we wouldn't include those patients that um, are refusing either the, the, the treatment or and or the prescription. Okay, now we're into our last measure in this set. This is our alcohol and drug use and assessing the status um, after discharge. The domain, again, is continuity of care. This also has turned into a process measure um, as of the first of next year, rather, and a higher rate is noted for improvement. We do know that relapse is common after the first week of discharge from the hospital, so this, again, is an important reason that we would want to continue to follow up and reach out to these patients. Looking now at our numerator and denominator statements, we've had some changes that have occurred now. This will be beginning with January 1 discharges again. We're looking at, again at the denominator uh, subsisting of patients that are reaching 18 years of age or older who were screened positive, again, for unhealthy alcohol use or who received that diagnosis of alcohol or drug use disorder during their hospital stay. Of those patients, then, we would be taking a look at the number of discharge patients that are contacted between 7 and 30 days after discharge, and the follow-up information regarding their alcohol or drug use status is collected. So this is a little bit different change now. We're looking at 7 to 30 days. That's the key change here in this. In our denominator populations, um, we would be taking a look at patients with a principal or other diagnosis code for alcohol or drug use disorder, as I previously described on tables 13.1 and 13.2, and patients with a principal or other procedure code um, identified in table 13.3. Patients that screen positive for unhealthy alcohol use or identified with a drug or alcohol dis disorder are also included. And um, once again, I've talked about what those procedures are. So we'd be looking at the, the detox or the alcohol or drug rehab. Um, we do have some exclusions here to the denominator. In these exclusions, we have a couple of new ones. And cognitive impairment and refusing a screening are now uh, have been added. But we're also excluding those younger patients. Um, taking a look at patients that were not screened or refused alcohol use as an exclusion less than one day length of stay or greater than 120, uh, patients who would have expired or left AMA, and a few more here, if they got discharged to another hospital or a health care facility, they were discharged to hospice care, patients not residing in the United States, patients with no phone or contact information, patients that went back to either a detention facility, jail or prison, and patients that were readmitted within that follow-up time frame would also be excluded. In a denominator, we're again looking at that alcohol use status and the, the alcohol and drug use disorder to make that determination to include them, admission date and birth date for calculation of age, um, cognitive impairment to remove them from the measure, um, discharge uh, date to determine length of stay, discharge disposition to remove those patients who had expired, and then again identifying those patients either with diagnosis or procedure codes as having that alcohol or drug use disorder. Looking at the numerator populations and the included and excluded populations, there are no additional ones. And in our numerator data elements, um, we have now parsed these out. Very similar to the tobacco uh, treatment measure. We're looking um, in that follow-up to see if the patients have had um, the continued counseling and the medication and if they have quit. And what we mean by quit, either alcohol or drug use, that would be defined as no use in the previous seven days. And um, actually, I misspoke, we're only evaluating the alcohol uh, quit status. So you wouldn't be uh, taking a look at the uh, drug on this one, because that's actually on the next slide. So for this one, we're only looking at, at the drug use. So there's two different questions actually to ask and answer here. And then again with that follow-up, it's very similar to the tobacco treatment measure. We're looking at six attempts um, being documented between 7 and 30 days after discharge. Again, if a clinic visit occurred within the time frame, you can use that to answer yes as a follow-up. Um, once again, if mail or email is returned is not valid or the patient was readmitted within the time frame, the case would be excluded. And the attempts, again, need to be recorded in the medical record. And the date, again, 
has been changed from the earliest to the latest date of contact. If uh, no contact was um, noted, then you would select unable to determine. So now um, we do have a place where you can submit questions to the Joint Commission um, Performance uh, Measurement Network uh, Q&A forum. And the address is noted here. The web address is noted here on this slide. You can also view the measure specifications from the same location. Um, they are both the current ones and then the future ones that I've discussed in today's presentation are available there. Um, today's slides are current as of today, um, so we just need to let you know about that, that they could potentially change in the future. And I think at this point now we are open to answer any questions that you might have about um, the Joint Commission measure specifications. Misty? I think we're going to pass it over to Eric Gothelrud. Okay. Thank you, Missy. And uh, I think what we'd like to do is is to uh, open up the the uh, the phone or to uh, or type in questions. If there are any questions around clarification clarification of any of the measures that were uh, described uh, uh, before we get into talking about how do you implement them, uh, just if if you have any. Uh, 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 questions that, that came up during uh, during uh, Celeste's uh, uh, presentation and uh, a description of the measures. Eric, we actually have received one question from Christy Abdul. I'll go ahead and read it out loud. The question is, so if our healthcare system is working to write ESPERT into EPIC for alcohol, we should also work on doing this to meet the TOB measures, correct? Cecile? I, Cecile, uh, are you, I'm sorry, Celeste, are you there? I, it, it, I, I guess my response is yes, that makes an awful lot of sense. Uh, because Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Eric, I was okay. muted. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes, please answer. Okay, sorry. Yeah, they had me muted. Um, okay, the question had to do with whether they would need to do both sets. I think, if I'm understanding the correction, the the question correctly, and these are these are um, mutually exclusive set, or what do I want to say? They're they're you don't have to do both. You can do one or the other, or you can do both. So there's no requirement that if you're doing substance use that you have to do tobacco treatment. Um, we just. Today's presentation was primarily to discuss both of the measure sets so that you had an understanding that there are two unique sets out there. When these were originally piloted, they were all included as the tobacco and alcohol um, measures, so there was one set. But we, we divided them out into two distinct sets following our pilot testing activities, so the hospital would have that option to select one or both. Thank you. Uh, Celeste, oh, I'm sorry, I keep calling you Celeste. Uh, yeah, Celeste. Um, yeah, you're right. Yes, yeah, you're, you're right. right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Have have these measures or some of these measures been e-specified? That's a good question, Eric. Actually, that's one of the initiatives that the Joint Commission is undertaking with all of their core measures. And we have completed some uh, e-specification work on the first uh, two substance use measures, substance use one and two. Um, and we're in the process of working on the, the additional measures and then working on the tobacco treatment measures. Those are some goals that we have set that will be going into next year uh, as far as working on uh, e-specification. That certainly is the wave of the future, and we are indeed in the midst of that. So when the measures are electronically specified or specified for electronic uh, um, health records, that information then becomes available to the vendors and the hospitals? Yes, we'll be, um, we actually just had an annual vendor conference um, at the Joint Commission. It was a, a joint conference that the Joint Commission and CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, hold each year to give them kind of a briefing on what's happening. And we, we had practically a whole day of um, talking about the EHR and you know, the work that's being done towards specifying measures both on a national level, um, outside of Joint Commission, and what Joint Commission is doing. So we do absolutely keep the hospitals and the vendors um, in the know as far as where we're at with that. So 
definitely there will be open communication about that. Terrific. Um, also, when you were describing the screening uh, uh, measures, that's uh, sub one and tobe one. Yes. Uh, does the Joint Commission specify or strongly recommend one measure or screening tool, or is it up to the hospital to decide how they want to screen? Um, when we we're taking a look, I, you know, we talked about validated tools, at least for the alcohol use. So we just gave some examples of some of those. If the hospital was interested in finding out more about that, we listed those. I kind of went over those. I'd have to go back and look at that slide. Um, there are a number of them that, that have been tested that are considered to be good for using um, in, in the hospital setting to get a, a quick understanding of whether there might be an issue to explore a little bit further. But they should be validated tools. So we would we don't recommend one over the other. We we simply list the ones that we're aware of. There there could indeed be others, but these were the ones um, I have the slide here, such as the audit, the audit C, the assist, the tweak, craft, the mast, the G mast would be the ones that we would say they should be doing. We're looking at alcohol use. And once again, the cage wouldn't be recommended because that's for the severely alcohol dependent patients. So they should be selecting one of those validated tools. And if there are others that are out there that have indeed been validated that we're not aware of, let us know and we'll add that into the, into the data element form as far as another acceptable validated tool. Uh, that's, that's very helpful. If there are any further questions from attendees, please type them in and we will, get, uh, we will uh, have them answered. Uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, I would like to, to turn to, uh, to Carrie Broderick, who is an emergency physician at Denver General. Carrie has been a leader in the effort to uh, uh, integrate screening, brief intervention, and uh, referral to treatment into the routine emergency department practice at Denver General and has, uh, I'm not sure what your numbers are now, but last I saw well over 50,000 screens uh, for risky alcohol and drug use. And I've, I've asked Carrie to just uh, spend a few minutes with us reflecting on what her experience has been in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, developing and managing a, a data collection system for screening and brief intervention, a little bit reflecting on what their experience and problems and challenges uh, have been. Carrie, are you, are you there? Can you hear me, Eric? Yes, I can. Oh, good, good. So, yes, we uh, currently do uh, routine screening of patients that come into the emergency department or the walk-in clinic through the medical screening exam, but we, um, that screening by the nurses is a brief screen, so it currently includes six questions around alcohol, tobacco, and substance use, including prescription drug misuse. Then uh, during the hours that we have health educators on duty, so um, that's about 10 hours a day, uh, sometimes a little bit longer, they actually go around and they follow up with uh, the positives first and then the negatives to assure that they are truly negative. And they perform the assist with the patients. And then um, they provide brief intervention is, um, you know, they kind of roll it into it. <clears throat> and then they upload their numbers. Really, uh, we don't have an EHR right now. They upload their numbers into a shared database that uh, we share both with the billing uh, people as well as the trauma registry folks so that we can cross-reference uh, for which patients were part of trauma registry, which ones weren't, and then which ones the health educators um, billed for and got signatures for from the attendings or the health providers, and which ones had a bill go out so that we can make sure we're capturing those. We are currently working uh, with Siemens um, at the hospital to develop, I think it's a beta um, electronic health record, and I'm not exactly sure what the final expert questions will look like that will go into that database, uh, but we are negotiating some of those now. We don't currently go up to the inpatient 
uh, area. They, uh, there is an alcohol uh, team in the hospital, so they do get referrals. <clears throat> we are working on getting an automatic referral uh, for the surgical services so that if they admit a patient, there's a prompt that will say, is this patient being admitted due to trauma? And then an automatic consult will go out to the uh, addiction team in the hospital so those patients will get an automatic referral. But that's uh, currently being um, worked on by the IT folks. Um, challenges are, you know, trying to make sure that we are in the new EHR system and how, how we will be able to link uh, to that. Um, and that some of those measures are going to be going into place, I think, in January. Um, but I, I don't really have the final details, like I said, on what that EHR and the SBIRT questions will look like. We will still continue to, of course, be down in the emergency department, and we modify those questions occasionally. Um, and um, it's uh, since the so we have well over 50,000 patients. Since the grant uh, ended last time and we've taken over, the hospital has paid for those salaries, which is uh, we've probably screened um, with two health educators. I think we're up to about 2,000 patients in the last, um, I guess we'll be in the last year. So, what what have been what have been the the successes, surprises, challenges in trying to track and uh, monitor the, uh, the 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 expert services in your in your hospital? Well, developing our own uh, database that we could share with other people, but um, that's really. Uh, uh, we kind of mastered that through an access database with, like I said, with the trauma registry folks who have been very, very helpful. And we, tr you know, track the basics as far as age and demographics and services provided. We don't do, um, we currently don't do any follow-up with patients. So as far as the joint measure with doing some follow-up on patients, our health educators uh, don't do any of that. They make referrals. They try and link people to treatment if possible. And uh, we do have uh, some resources at the hospital. We have an outpatient behavioral health department that is very good, but um, we don't we don't really do any of the follow up on the patients. I think one of our uh, continued problems with Espert, and I, I guess I it's a good problem to have, is that they get consulted a lot on patients who are addicted, and um, you know the Espert to me is really trying to get at patients early on and not be the addiction people that we uh, that takes up a lot of resources. So we continue to struggle with trying to get people earlier in their spectrum of substance or alcohol uh, use. And um, But it, the expert the health educators are, have been embraced, uh, you know, hospital-wide. They're, they're known. They get calls all the time from various areas outside of the department, which sometimes they're able to go and assist. But um, so I think it's uh, you know really taking on a life of its own that people uh, really value the services that they get from the health educators for their patients. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. The the billing uh, I think uh, Eric, as you know, is continued to be a barrier for us. I continue to track that, and we are a quasi county hospital, Denver Health, so. We have a very large number of patients that are uh, homeless and indigent, have no uh, form of payment, and we also have a fairly uh, large, um, it's called the Colorado Indigent Care Program, where we just get one bundled fee for the whole emergency department service. So uh, out of all the patients that we do bill, we still are only collecting about, I think we're still at maybe, we're, maybe we're up to 6% of collections uh, on that. Um, so hospitals that have more third-party payers uh, would probably do quite a bit better. And I did see the webinar for the Oregon program um, that was just a few weeks ago, and it seems that they have some real successes. So I think that 
uh, for us, you know, the reimbursement will never even come close to paying for the service up front, but of course it's the back end of all the prevention and the community um, outreach. And I think that where we see the money, it's always hard to convince administrators of that. But for now, uh, they seem to be on board for us. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. I'd like to turn the, this, this over now to a more general discussion. If there are uh, any of you who have questions, please type them in. And I'd, I'd like to, to raise one question which came from uh, uh, one of the attendees. The question is, are, are these measures required or are they voluntary at, at this point? In uh, her discussion with their executive team, they're asking this question. I guess this is a question for you, uh, Celeste. And to take your, yourself off mute. Hello, Celeste? Can you hear me? Can you now, hear me? Now I can. Hello. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> it's not me. I'm being muted at two ends here. But anyway, I am back online. And um, the question had to do whether these were required, I believe, or mandatory. Was that the question? Yes. Okay. Um, at this point, the Joint Commission has a total of 14 core measure sets that hospitals that are accredited by Joint Commission can use to select to meet their ORCS requirement. Out of those 14 sets, um, since 2008, hospitals have been required to select a minimum of four measure sets. So these are just additional measure sets that they can either use to um, meet their accreditation requirement or above and beyond the four minimum sets. So there is no requirement for anyone to use these in a mandatory fashion. Okay. Is there any immediate likelihood that they would move from being one of the, the sets from which hospitals can choose into something that would either be mandatory or highly incented? At this point, there are no uh, plans at the Joint Commission to do anything different as far as uh, requiring these sets. But once again, they remain optional. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a question about the tobacco set. Uh, what all is included in the smokeless tobacco products? I'm assuming that's nicotine gum, patches, other nicotine products would not be included in this. Is that correct? You're talking about smokeless tobacco products? I believe we're looking at like the snuffs. That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, when you start talking about nicotine gum and patches, that would actually be part of the treatment, such yeah. as some of the FDA approved cessation medications. Right. And um, I'm just so looking right right now at my specifications for tobacco. But um, when we talk about smokeless, it's and there's other terms besides snuff. That's what I was looking to see. Um, to describe that, but that's what we mean by smokeless tobacco. Okay. Uh, whereas, like I say, the gum and the patches would be considered a medication. They wouldn't really be considered a, a form of smokeless tobacco. Okay, that just it's probably a, a, a detail, but I'm sure it reassures folks. Right. And another question that's been raised is, well, perhaps it was all it was discussed in your presentation, but the requirement that there be a uh, a, a handoff or a warm handoff may not be possible in some areas, such as Kentucky, uh, due to its limitations. Further, most mental health professionals require patients to make those appointments themselves. Could you discuss this a little bit more about how, uh, how a referral or a patient-initiated uh, uh, making an appointment plays a role in the referral process, given the limitations outside of hospitals. OK. Um, I'm not quite sure. Are they talking about for the outpatient counseling? Yeah, this is. Uh, I think this is primarily for the sub-4 measure. Oh, for, OK, for sub-4, because you actually have two types of you know counseling here. So that's why I was trying to be clear on that. Um, but yes, we, we do understand that there are certain parts of the country where it's a little more difficult sometimes to make those referrals. But um, when we're looking at for the substance use measure, that would be referral to addiction treatment. Um, 
we pretty much are just looking that they are followed up with someone that specializes in addiction treatment. Um, so this could be a mental health program or a mental health specialist for follow-up for substance use or addiction treatment or to a medical or a health professional for follow-up for substance use or addiction. So there's no requirement that it necessarily, necessarily is a mental health program. It could also be just a medical or a health professional to follow up. So it could be someone that in their community that um, has training in that or in the area that has training in that. There's no requirement that they have to go into a formal program. I'm, I'm thinking that's what they're asking here. I'm not quite clear on what the question is. Well, I think there may be two questions Im embedded, and if I'm getting it wrong, please type type in uh, and clarify the question. One is, in 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 many communities, there are very limited uh, specialty substance use treatment options available, and will the hospital be penalized on this measure if there aren't community resources available for patients to go to? Well, if, I'm sorry, that sounded like someone else was there. Um, the requirement for substance use three it, to pass this measure would be that you had made either a referral for addictions treatment or that they were receiving the medication. So in that case, then, if they're wasn't the ability to make this referral, then the medication should be prescribed and then they should be following up with someone to be monitoring the use of the medication. This is one where it's an either or, whereas with the tobacco treatment, the, the practical counseling should continue in an outpatient setting along with the cessation medication. With substance use three, we make the option of either or. So if, if it's difficult to get them into a, an addictions treatment program per se, we, we do um, have written in our specifications that it could be either or, the, the referral or the prescription for the medication at discharge. Okay, okay. And so you're opening up uh, a greater range, just to uh, I guess repeat, you're, gro you're opening up a much broader range of treatment referral sources so that it can be primary care to a community health center to uh, 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 mental health program, as long as there is a uh, a, a discharge uh, recommendation or discharge orders to uh, uh, refer to substance use treat treatment for the substance use disorder. Correct. Once again, it could either be the prescription, which again you'd want them to follow up with a health care provider or actual referral to someone that specializes in addiction treatment. And we're very broad in our definition of what consists of addiction treatment, as I indicated. Um, it could be group counseling, individual counseling, and the individual counseling can be performed by their personal physician, it could be their primary care provider, a psychiatrist or a psychologist or an addictions counselor, someone that um, had training in that type of counseling could perform it individually or it could be a group counseling um, type of referral for addictions treatment. So if, I guess in the case where you are in very rural America and it's very difficult to find uh, the, the, the proper person with that training or the healthcare professional with that training, um, there are medications that can be offered and those could be monitored by the primary care physician then. Okay, very, very helpful. Thank you. Is there a is there competency evaluation available for staff in relation to educating patients concerning smoking, alcohol, or drug cessation usage? Not every staff may be competent in providing uh, patient education. And I would agree with that, that that's probably something that would require a specialized type of program that they would need to complete in order to provide this type of counseling um, or to do the brief intervention. We don't have any requirements um, in, in the measure set itself about that, but when you look at Joint Commission standards, we do have requirements for um, hospital staff to be competent in, in what they're setting out to do. So if someone was going to be offering that sort of thing, it would be up to the hospital to evaluate their competency, that they're trained specifically to do that. For example, if you're a, um, a 
professional working like in an emergency room or in an intensive care unit, you should have ACLS training. So this would be very similar here if you're going to put someone in that role of offering um, the, um, the expert, um, the intervention, you want someone that's been specifically trained and is competent. So it would really be up to your HR department and your um, as part of your hospital standard that you'd be following that you would make sure that these patients patients, I'm sorry, staff are competent to perform this uh, intervention. So that kind of falls back on hospital to, to, to have those policies and procedures in place. Let, let, let me uh, then sort of pivot just a, a bit to, uh, to Carrie. And we have a question about Denver Health. And let me make this sort of two questions. One is, who does SBIRT on off hours when the health educators are not there? And then also, Terry, if you could answer the question of uh, how do you assess or, or facilitate the competency of your health educators to do the health education? Yes, uh, Eric. So when the health educators aren't there, um, they really don't get the full service because there's just no time for the nurses or the residents to be performing the assist and capturing them using that tool. But um, So they really don't get the full service. Not to say that, uh, that they don't get some brief intervention by the medical staff, certainly because they're much more aware of it all and are around the health educators quite a bit. So they don't really get that unless, of course, I'm on or one of the residents that may be working on a project with me that's more involved. And I can't remember the second part of your uh, question, Eric. What was that? Basically, how, how do you assess the competence of your health educators or how do you support their competence to deliver the service? Yeah, well, they go to, um, you know, intermittent trainings. So when they first come on, they do get trained uh, with a partner of ours, peer assistance, so they get trained in the motivational interviewing techniques, um, they get trained in the assist tool, and then they intermittently get trained on motivational interviewing either through peer assistance or classes or webinars. Um, they get shadowed by uh, peer assistants, so we're lucky to have them on board to help them with their motivational interviewing. And I guess that's really their competency. Now for the expert in general, there is a module that we have built for the hospital through its a web-based training. So any new person that comes on in the areas where the SBIRT program has either been in place or is currently in place, the new nurses, the residents, the staff are assigned that module on SBIRT. It's about an hour long. And it talks about screening and brief intervention in general, about the statistics. But there's also uh, clinical vignettes where they uh, walk through doing a motivational interviewing with I think it's four different types of patients, you know, the kind of resistant patient, the person with tobacco only, the person with drug addiction, and there's built-in uh, kind of tests along the way that they take <clears throat> about, you know, how they're doing, and then they complete that module. Right now it's just a one-time module, but uh, um, we probably will reassign it in various areas. Okay. Um, and how do you document the expert services are, are, are being delivered? Those well, the health, just the health educator. So two ways. One is if the person does, perf uh, not a health educator, but a provider performs a brief intervention, they can actually document it currently in the emergency department, the walk-in clinic. On, it's right on their uh, kind of encounter form, their intake form, where the brief questions are. And then, it, you know, there's a place to document what, whether it was a brief intervention, whether they referred the person and then uh, what their score was on the assist. The health educators, when they are there, they actually keep track of that throughout the day and they upload it into a shared drive at the hospital that we share, as I said, with both the billing people as well as the trauma registry. Okay, good. Um, I, question back to, uh, to Cecile, uh, Celeste, I'm sorry to Celeste is um, if a hospital, if the hospital on discharge were to give the, a, a patient a telephone number of a treatment program and say, please make this phone, make, make uh, an appointment for yourself, would that be sufficient for the purpose of, of uh, 
sub three before I get to token. Okay, there. Um, you were cutting out a little bit there, Eric. Um, okay. So you're looking at referral now for um, the uh, continued addictions treatment, correct? Right, and at discharge, the hospital gives the patient uh, a telephone number and says, uh, we encourage you to, to contact this, this uh, uh, treatment provider. Here's the telephone number. Uh, you know, we encourage you to call them. Is, is, is that sufficient? Um, we say that it's defined as an appoint. It could be defined as an appointment that's made by the provider, um, either through telephone contact, fax, or email, or that the referral may be to an addictions treatment program. So we don't say that the hospital necessarily has to make the phone call. It could be either that they've made an appointment or they've made the referral. Um, so as long as they're giving the patient the information that they need to contact the, the treatment program, uh, such as you know, the name of it, the, the phone number, the hours that they can call to, to get in, that's considered to be a referral. And then you do remember, of course, um, with Measure 4, um, part of the responsibility would be then to follow up with that patient between 7 and 30 days to make sure that they have indeed begun uh, their addictions treatment. Um, if that was one of the things that they had suggested to the patient at the time of discharge. Okay, very good. Can you tell us what the the next steps will be for the Joint Commission in moving these measures forward? Uh, sure. The Joint Commission is in the process right now of working on seeking endorsement for both of these measure sets through the National Equality Forum which is something that we do with all of our core measure sets. So we're in that process right now, and we're included in a project that's scheduled to meet sometime after the first of the year. So we're working through that process right now. Following um, endorsement, then the measures will all be evaluated under our accountability criteria, which is something that we've been doing over the last year or so. Uh, people have been following that. Um, we take a look at making sure that there's a, a strong research base, which we know is available or is, uh, exists, I should say, to support these measures. The proximity of the process that you're measuring to the desired outcome, that there are no uh, additional unintended consequences. I can't think of the fourth one right off the top of my head, but we have four criteria that we would be evaluating them against to make sure that they're considered accountable. And then once they are considered accountability measures, then um, they would be, if hospitals select them, then these would be measures that would be reported publicly on our, um, on our quality check website. They'd also be used in the accreditation process. We actually have a new standard that's in place um, as the beginning of this year that um, on core measures, hospitals that are reporting them, all, all of the measures that they're reporting, they have to um, achieve uh, at least a minimum composite rate of 85 percent on all our performance measures, so it would be used as part of the accreditation process as well. So that's what our next steps are at this point in time. Um, however, hospitals are free to select them should they choose to do that even prior to um, National Quality Forum endorsement. We've actually done that in the past with some of our other core measure sets, um, so they certainly can select them. Um, it's just that the difference would be if they selected them prior to endorsement, they wouldn't be publicly reported or used in the accreditation process, we would keep them in what we call test mode until they've received that, that endorsement. So they are available right now for hospitals to select. Um, and typically, to select a measure set, you would uh, go to your e-app and work um, through the performance measurement um, section of the, of the e-app to select your core measure sets. And then they would be recorded. And that usually, you have to do that at the beginning of a quarter. So for example, the 1st of October is like Monday. You could actually start data collection the fourth quarter of this year if you desired, or you could start at the beginning of next year. So it's available for you to pretty much do anything uh, in as far as selection with the beginning of any of the quarters for, for joint commission purposes. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Are, are there any other joint commission measures that you know that require patient follow-up? Because it, it's, it's likely there would be pushback or concern from the hospital about the expense of doing uh, uh, following up patients post-discharge. We're certainly sensitive to that issue, Eric. Um, at this point, I don't believe there are any of our core measures that uh, address that as one of the measures. Um, some of our measures do have 
a referral piece, for example, if you're familiar with our hospital-based inpatient psychiatric services measures, we do have an actual measure there that takes a look at, um, a couple of measures that take a look at the patients referred to a next level of care provider and that you communicate key pieces of information to you know, promote continuity of care. But there's no actual follow-up piece to see if the patient actually um, made the appointment or kept the appointment. There was some discussion um, when that set was uh, formed, but at that point in time, um, it was decided um, there were some unique circumstances within the psychiatric community that, that may not always be possible. So this is uh, certainly a move in a different direction to uh, do this, but this is not an uncommon thing if you look at other parts of the hospitals. For example, if they're providing ambulatory surgery services, it's not uncommon for those patients to receive a follow-up call a day or two after they've had a, a procedure to see how they're doing. So this would be uh, somewhat of a change for hospitals um, to, to meet this, and, and we are sensitive to that. And it was one thing, though, that our technical advisory panel felt would be important and would be an opportunity to make sure that the patient is continuing with that um, treatment that they've been referred to. And just to get a little better understanding how, of how often that happens by, by making that call to assess their status, whether they have they quit, are they still you know, taking the medication, are they still receiving either the counseling or the addictions treatment. So this is sort of a step in the, in the continuity of patient care you know, across the continuum of care and transitioning out to another setting um, that we're trying to do a reach out for that. It certainly seems consistent with the whole emphasis that we have, have heard for, for many years and, and coming to a crescendo about caring for uh, entire episodes of care or care, uh, 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 supporting patients' health, which persists beyond the, the, the acute treatment, but really follows the patient so that uh, they can uh, 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 reintegrate back in the community, uh, their, they can manage their, their illness and their recovery. So it certainly is consistent with the ACOs, accountable care organizations, with the patient-centered medical home, and it's really, really good to see the Joint Commission moving in this direction around, um, around supporting episodes of care, not only just what happens in the hospital. Um, we may be able, and I'm not sure that our technology is going to let us, but I'm going to try. Uh, uh, Cecile de Heibetter from Gunderson Lutheran Hospital has, has for, the, for, for some time been working in a hospital that has been doing ESPERT, first started in their trauma center and now has moved into their entire hospital. And they have built in the, uh, the sub-measures, the substance abuse measures into their hospital-wide reporting set. And I'd ask uh, Cecile if she can to talk a little bit about their experiences. We may be having technical problems, but if possible. Cecile, can you, can you call in? Are you in? I finally got through. <laughs> Terrific. Could you talk a little bit about the experience that you've had at uh, Gunderson Lutheran? I sure can. Here, let me. I've got feedback. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. If you could just turn your speakers off, that will stop the feedback. Okay. Well, I'm getting the feedback off my computer. Um, I've been listening to your website, so I know exactly what's been going on there. I've been listening to you, but unfortunately I was unable to get on the line. Um, our program at Gunderson Lutheran started out with the trauma service. So three years ago, we put into, with a Whipple grant, we put in one individual into the position of doing the screening and intervention for all of our trauma patients. As the program developed and we could see that we were having good results, when we knew that there was potential for this to develop further, and since it was the right thing for the patient, we applied it. We applied to administration with a business plan to see if we could add one FTE, that grant position, and assimilate it with our physical, ther our cardiac rehab therapist, 
who already were doing smoking cessation. The goal of our program is to do the alcohol, the drug, and the tobacco assessment. We currently have it in place so that the, the, every patient that is admitted to our facility automatically has a wellness order placed. The process is, a, is screened by the nursing staff as part of our every, every admission of every patient. The smoking is the one thing that I think we have to change a little bit to meet the, the compliance for the Joint Commission in that the numbers of cigarettes and things do not jive exactly with the numbers that you want pulled. So that's one thing we have to change, but we pull, we assess for tobacco, we do an audit C and cage question for alcohol, and, el and illicit drugs is primarily, do you use any illicit drugs or inappropriate use of prescription medication? If that's a yes or no consult, a yes or no answer, we automatically have a consult placed. So with the order put in on every patient, what happens is anyone that screens positive through their assessment, we have built a report that we run every morning that gives a report to the cardiac physiologist and the wellness coordinator, and they divide among themselves all the patients that need to be done that day. On the weekends, we have one individual on call who comes in in the morning and runs the report and provides all the interventions needed for whatever area is required. And then our program is set up to where we are currently doing follow-up and uh, once upon discharge, we are doing a one-week follow-up, a one-month follow-up, a six-month, and a one-year. I can only give you data right now through the first, the one-month follow-up because we have not been able to, we don't have them all completed through six months yet. That piece of our program has been implemented starting last December, so we're just getting to that six-month follow-up. <clears throat> We are seeing very good results at 30 days out. We are seeing a 70% change, positive change in the population that agrees to a follow-up. I think the key piece of our program has been that the individual that provides the original intervention is also the one that does the follow-up. So they already have a relationship built and I think that's a crucial piece of our program. I think the other thing that we are noticing, um, we are only currently 25% of the patients agree to follow up. And that is, I think, a place that we really need to pay attention. If it is done by the wellness coordinator, who is very good at motivational interviewing, and, and her proposal is the way she presents it is, you know, we've got a plan here. What if I just call you in a week and see how we're doing? Most patients will say yes. The other approach that I see and I've seen out in the communities and in the regions and in other hospitals is, I can either call you or offer you this brochure. Which would you like? They take the brochure. Okay, so what my suggestions would be to anyone who is looking to develop this is to really train the individuals providing the intervention to promote continued contact with these patients because it seems that the continued contact will eventually give you positive change. So that's where we're at currently with our program. All of our notes, the consult is in the computer on the electronic medical record. So you have the order that's placed, the consult is placed in the electronic medical record. The billing is placed in the electronic medical record. The follow-up is placed as a phone conversation that automatically populates so that when the outpatient people follow up with this patient, they can see their last contact with this patient and put an upgrade in there as to how they're doing. Am I talking to the air or is somebody out there? Not at all. Uh, so you're saying that you have implemented and your hospital has implemented these measures. Right. And the concerns that you know have come up in 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 this call and in other discussions about the cost to the hospital of doing this, how how did you deal with that? We really have not had it. so we had a one full time position that is a required for the American College of Surgeons. And that's where I think we have a direct buy-in into trauma centers, because it's already required for level one trauma centers. So we already had the cost built in for the trauma program. All we essentially did was with a little unique collaboration with cardiology, we incorporated our wellness coordinator with the exercise physiology people and then took the assessment out of the equation so that the people were truly used for what they're good at, motivational interviewing. And so the assessment portion was built into the computer so that the appropriate tools were used. 
and then it would build an automatic score that we could pull to do the, the consult. The one thing that we found with nursing is even the asking of the questions, if they feel that they have to intervene at all, they seem uncomfortable and they back away from it. So by building it this way to where it was a yes or no answer or a number of how much you do, how much you drink, or how much you smoke, they, didn't, they weren't uncomfortable doing that and they weren't judgmental. Compared to if they had to provide the interventions, they weren't comfortable. So by this way, by just answering the questions, they identified the population that needed to have it done for us, and we used the exercise physiology individuals and the wellness coordinator to actually optimize their skills for just doing the, the actual interventions and the follow-up. So we essentially have no additional cost. So by building it into your EHR and separating the screening from the brief intervention and follow-up, right. you've, you've been, and, and also by going from where it's required, which is in the trauma center, through the rest of the hospital, you haven't really encountered much in, you, uh, resistance. No. Well, uh, I, I, I can push pretty hard if I think it's the right thing, Eric. <laughs> but no, we really haven't. We've met some resistance, but it's been it's very, very solidly supported. You know, the business case here was that we had to pay the cost of one person that was essentially coming off a grant position, but that was required for trauma, so we had to have it. But her salary is easily compensated with the income that is made off the, the billing. Okay. Uh, just to, just for, to, to help people understand where you're coming from, where is Gunderson Lutheran, and how did you manage to do this? Uh, Gunderson Lutheran is in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We sit right on the Mississippi River between Wisconsin and Minnesota on the southern part of the state. We are a very rural uh, serve, uh, hospital. We are a tertiary level two trauma center with five associated hospitals, small facilities, and uh, 19 clinics. And uh, currently we are, it started, most places have been starting in the outpatient field because that's where the requirements were. But the passion here came out of the inpatient because of the trauma. So essentially our program now is we've done the inpatient and it carries over for the outpatient records. Our pa patients are not transients. These are patients that stay within our health system. So by having it incorporated into the medical record for the outpatient, the physicians, when they come back to their office, can see what's been done. We are also expanding it to the outpatient where we will be doing in-family practice. The concern that I have, and I'm not quite satisfied with the way the project is going, is the fact that there's an interesting article out there is, will hospitals do the right thing? And I think that's where the Joint Commission needs to be very clear on some of what is acceptable and what meets the standard and what does not. Um, I, you know, like I said with our follow-up, you know, the way it's presented to them, our staff just says, you know, I really like where we've gotten so, so far. Can I call you back in a week? And most of them say yes. On the other hand, if they're offered just literature, they'll just take that and then there's no more follow-up, no more opportunities for improvement. And that is what I fear in the family practice as it develops on, at our facility, is that I'm seeing individuals saying, well, why can't we just hand them the paper? It meets the standard. So that's why I caution you as before some of those get set out. And I know the tobacco is already out, but you know, is it enough to just hand a piece of paper? Is that actually effective change? And I, I, I guess that's my caution to you. I know it's harder to keep the follow-up. We follow up three times three phone calls for each attempt, and the, it is very time consuming, and I can see where facilities would just as soon hand out the paperwork and make the ownership on the patient rather than to try to really move forward with the right thing for the patient. So our facility, we see, we admit about 15 to 17,000 a year into our hospital, and our po trauma population is about 1,000 a year. Well, we've come to the to the end of our time. Although I I know that there are still are questions in queue, uh, we have if if there are any further questions that you have or would like more more information about the joint commission measures or how to implement the measures, please contact Misty Story or myself, and we will make sure that the questions get answered. Thank you very much for participating. I want to particularly thank our presenters, 
uh, Celeste Milton, Terry Broderick, and Cecile Dhaivetter. And again, thank you all for participating, and we look forward to working with you in the big hospital expert initiative. Thank you. Uh -uh. Eric? Yes. I'm really sorry. I just, I am so... I the organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.